Greg Eisenberg calls himself a stand-up philosopher, and he's written a book of jokes, one-liners, more than 700 of them. But these aren't your typical jokes. He likes to think of them as mind-altering jokes. And what they do is they play with the notion of cognitive dissonance. They take philosophical notions and then they pull them apart in two different directions. And he's hoping where that gap occurs in the middle is where some new thinking, some new ideas will come through. He's asking us to challenge what we already know, the way we think, the way we perceive the world. And he's hoping to create a new, a new language, if you like, that we can use to understand why we're here, or at least to get comfortable with not understanding why we're here. So I sat down with Greg to talk about his book, which is called Letting Go is All We Have to Hold On To, and that should give you some idea of the, the kind of content. And it touches on religion. It t- talks about physics, science, mathematics. There's astrophysics in there as well. And there's a lot of Greek philosophy, ancient philosophy. And he's hoping that, in a way, by challenging these notions with these jokes, we can draw a line under the thinking that's got us this far and create some new thinking, which is going to take us further, an evolutionary step forward, if you like. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation with me and Greg. You can get his book on Amazon and hang around at the end because I've got a few more URLs and bits of information for you at the end. So Greg, uh, thank you for joining me on the podcast. You are the author of a book. Uh, it's an unusual book. It's called Letting Go is All We Have to Hold On To. And it's, um, uh, you call the mind altering jokes. They're kind of philosophical one-liners. Um, and you also you also perform these 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 jokes as well. Um, and I, I'm kind of hesitating on the word jokes because there's a little bit more to it than just kind of, you know, doing stuff for, for laughs. So maybe you could give us, give us a bit of an introduction to what the book is about and what the, the kind of thinking is behind the, the comedy, if you like. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for asking, Chris. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed That's listening right. to the previous podcast guests that you've had. Um, and um, I, appreciate the spirit of inquiry that you bring to your show. And I think I bring a similar kind of spirit of inquiry into my humor. Okay. Um, but it is, it is, it, it, it's a collection of mind altering jokes. It's 16 yeah. chapters long. It's all original. I um, build on a lot of ideas and material from other writers and I quote a lot of other people, but essentially it's um, a series of one sentence long I call them little vignettes that yeah. are funny, and they um, met much of the material uh, deals with philosophical issues and, and um, issues of the human condition, I guess you could say, and what is it to be human, and what is knowledge, and how does our mind work, and uh, yeah. how do we form our perceptions? So uh, some people have called it Buddhist humor, actually, because it's concerned with the mind and how thoughts are constructed. And uh, it, they've also been called, it was called a modern collection of, uh, a collection of modern Zen koans. Because in a way, it takes the Zen koan idea really and, and, and presents it for the modern audience. And I think the idea of Zen koans was to show, um, and I don't want to be too succinct, uh, but yep. to show the futility of thought and the futility of thinking and hopefully to maybe create a little distance for meditators or practitioners of Buddhism to separate from their own thought process a little bit and get a sense of what knowledge is and how the mind works. And so these were just jokes that we sat around in my hot tub with my friends. We were just joking around. I did yep. not set out to write a book of jokes, but Once we started doing it, I think I started um, stumbling into a set of formula about humor and what makes something funny and how to construct these one second, one sentence aphorisms, which I also call laphorisms. Yeah. And it became more than just now I started writing them down. And then eventually, you know, I think that I, I've been a writer since childhood. I, I sensed I hit a vein. And I was right. I hit several big veins and I wrote for years and years. And I learned uh, how to refine my technique as time went on. And so now I have this collection of um, what I also hesitate to call jokes. And people have said, you know, because 
I call them the Eisenberg principles to also. My name is Greg Eisenberg. And it's, uh, it's just wordplay. And really, I'm just a, I, I play with language. I'm playing with language, I'm playing with ideas, and I employ what I call the Socratic method, which is yeah. kind of a combination of Socrates and sarcasm. So it's really just a book of Socrasm. But kind of using the, what Socrates did is he showed, he followed, he took initial ideas that sounded reasonable on their own, but then took them to their sort of illogical conclusion and showed that they, they didn't really constitute true knowledge. And so um, he cleverly did show how he's not the wisest man in Athens, which is what he set out to do. Um, yeah, I remember reading, um, you said this in, uh, in your kind of notes beforehand, you know, he, he mm -hmm. set out to prove that he wasn't the cleverest man in Athens, but he did it in a way that proved he was the cleverest man in Athens. So there's well, this kind I, of... I, I, yeah, <laughs> that's this, a joke I wish yeah. was in my book. Like, yeah, yeah. He, he, he set out to prove he wasn't the cleverest man in Athens, and he did it in a way that no one else could refute. <laughs> yeah. So he really did. And, and he, he was knocking down ideas of... Con there are a lot of snake oil salesmen around, and there still are. And he, would, he, he, he liked to knock ideas down or upend them or show that they were really fallible ideas. They're, and that knowledge is very tenuous. And I think that Zen koans do something similar. And I think my jokes also do something similar. So um, it's more than just a collection of jokes. I agree. And uh, I mean, some of the things you say in it, I mean, one of the things you say in it is, um, one of your one-liners is, is something along the lines of, um, the only thing I can be certain about is that I, I'm not certain of, of anything. Mm -hmm. The only thing I know for sure is that I know nothing. And this is actually, I mean, it, it is enough to kind of make people laugh as a one-liner, but it's, it's actually just kind of raw philosophy there, isn't it? There's, there's a kind of um, a, it's it's true essentially that's all we know is that we really know nothing and the wise man you know when he when he becomes really wise he knows that he knows nothing that the the foolish man thinks he knows everything and the wise man realizes he knows nothing you know and it's this is this is a, a, not a new thing this is kind of ancient wisdom that you're kind of repeating here in a in a new way and it's kind of the humor's already there in a way yeah, like Emerson said, all of my just best jokes were stolen by the ancients. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that I mean, this is this is kind of, in a way, kind of raw philosophy, but just presented in a in a humorous way with a sort of humorous I, twist. I, I'm glad you think so. Uh, you know, I was uh, I'd like to say that there's a variety of jokes in the book, and so yes. some of them I'm just going for laughs. Like I just want to loosen you up. I want to get the reader to like me. I want the reader to feel that I'm a credible voice to listen to. Yeah. And then I want to do another one that's kind of just another funny thing. It doesn't maybe even mean all that much. And then hit you with something that actually resonates deeper and invokes a, you know, a more serious subject. But, you know, a joke like, I started partying on Wednesday this week just to take a little pressure off the weekend. Yeah. You know, like that's just to get a little laugh. Um, but the joke that you were referring to is, uh, I think, nihilists claim we, we don't know anything. I don't even think we know that. Yeah, exactly. So that is more on, a, on the philosophical side. And I am yeah. playing with what constitutes knowledge. And I'm not even saying we don't know, I guess. But this is it. I mean, there are, you talk a lot about in the introduction to the book about the limitations of language and how we need to kind of create a new language. You've gone as far as we can. And right now we're just kind of regurgitating what has been said for thousands of years. And we've taken it as far as we can with the, the limitations that we've, we've got. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to create something new. I mean, you, you talk about creating a kind of cognitive dissonance and somewhere in that gap is this kind of new, new space for um, a kind of new awareness, if you like. Um, is that what you're trying to achieve here with this humor, sort of kickstart something new? I think so. Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put it also. I, I think that ultimately the material is very non-dogmatic. And yeah. it, I'm kind of showing um, through lots of examples um, on, on lots of subjects about the human condition that a lot of statements that we make 
are tenuous in nature and can be undermined. And so I'm, I'm really kind of suggesting that what, what if we all could just agree that we actually are at the beginning of our knowledge about our, the true knowledge about who we are rather than at the end of that journey. And then, it's, so it's kind of forward looking material and it's somewhat optimistic in that it, yeah. there's, there's possibilities for new ways of thinking that we are yet to discover together. And this is an invitation to begin that journey together. So how do we start that journey? I mean, we need to start this kind of new conversation and, and this new language, but we're, we're kind of hobbled already by the words we've got, the thinking we've done. Where do we, where do we do this? Do we, does this go into spirituality or some sort of wordlessness or, you know, where does it begin? You know, the word that comes to my mind when you ask that, and it's a great question. It's a challenging question. Mm -hmm. um, um, because I feel that what I do is what Socrates did was um, kind of uh, destroy the base of evidence that we've been working with to refresh, to refresh in the playing field and refresh in the soil and kind of loosen the soil for new imaginative thinking. How we do it is, is a, the spirit of play is what I would say is invoked for me. I think that um, if we could take ourselves less seriously and take our, you know, the ideas that we usually think a yeah. little bit less seriously, we can start to pivot around things. And joke writing is a great way to open up your mind because when you write a joke about something, you, you, you walk all the way around it and you look at it from yeah. underneath and from above and from different angles and you try to see what would be a new angle on this familiar subject. And so my invitation is for us to play with ideas together and play with language and not feel like we know where it's going. Okay. Because we don't know where it's going. And, and so there's a bit of, like Miles Davis says, you know, don't play what's there, play what's not there. And so there's, there's a little bit of a jazz attitude of improvising and feeling our way forward. And I hope that epistemologists and linguists and mathematicians really do the heavy lifting in all of this. I'm just trying to be funny and open up the conversation. Because I mean, it, it does touch on philosophy, science, mathematics, you know, there's a little bit of everything in there, the, the, all the kind of the, the kind of checks and rules and measures that we use to divide, define our, our kind of existence as we know it is all kind of touched upon you know we've got we've got the science you've got the philosophy there's a there's a bit of religion in there as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i mean this is kind of old ground that keeps we're all going over it over and over and over again and you're kind of saying well let's just let's just rip it apart let's go forwards and you're trying to do that with kind of humor and 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 you said to me as well that um a way to do that is Kind of connect with people emotionally and you can do that with with comedy and making people laugh is it is that the next thing you know we come to the end of our sort of cognitive road if you like and now it's time for a more emotional journey sort of more human journey that's a very interesting question i, I mean as you know i am also a songwriter and have produced a large body of music which is as dear and near to me as this collection of humor and I've also written a body of poetry, which is more evocative and trying to get into the emotional realm. And um, I can't say what's next for the human journey in terms of increasing our, our self-knowledge. Yeah. But I would think that we are gonna have to be employing body wisdom. I know that when I write, I am, uh, um, I'm trying to draw from all of my resources and a lot of them are down in my gut, you know, yeah. and some of them are in my mind and some of them are floating around my nervous system. And some of them are just in the coincidences in the room around me. So, um, and maybe that is a way forward. Yeah. I mean, I mean, even this touches on kind of ancient wisdom, if you like, you know, the, um, the, Native Americans were very much in tune with their intuition and the changing seasons and all of this kind of thing. And so it's, it's almost feels like a kind of reawakening of, of something we already, we already know, but have kind of buried underneath maybe modern science and, and, and like say mathematics and 
all of this kind of stuff, dogma even? I, I think we're going to venture into things that uh, we don't we have not, we don't already know. Also, I think that maybe it's time to synthesize what we know about the world from modern science with what our cells are telling us about our relationship with nature. And we've gotten rather heady in the last 500 years yeah. to our benefit as we, as we must and as we shall continue to do to greatly to our benefit. And there's a lot to integrate. There's a lot, uh, there, I think that's why people, um, that's why people are complex and suffer from depression or angst. And we're busy digesting a lot of data and yeah. it's going to take a, it's going to take time to, to digest it. But, Hopefully that will be a smooth process where we can fluidly go into a future where we, in a way, don't even have to invoke ancient wisdom anymore because we know we are the carriers of the wisdom tradition ourselves. It's funny. We, uh, yeah. This is a, a conversation I've had a, a few times now. It seems to keep repeating that there's this kind of, um, um, I've heard it called an evolutionary mismatch so you know we as a as a species we've advanced since the iron age or whenever and our technology and our culture and our society has rapidly um, accelerated but as animals evolutionarily if that's a word um, mm -hmm. we're still left behind you know our, our rate of progress is very slow and we're trying to keep up up here in our in our brains and in our behaviors and and the way we kind of dress for work with our shirts and ties and what have you but we're still mm -hmm. ultimately just animals who've only recently kind of stepped out of the primordial soup you know and, and so we're, we're trying to catch up and that's causing us this kind of um, mismatch, like you say, we're getting depression and anxiety because our bodies and our, our minds were not made for this kind of the world. And it, it sounds like what you're suggesting is a kind of evolutionarily or an evolutionary step forward, you know, so stepping mm -hmm. forward into bringing ourselves as human animals in line with kind of where we are with our technology and also where we are with you know our place on this planet and in this universe and and that kind of thing so almost like a kind of futuristic vision of um you know where we need to be going through comedy you know i agree it's forward looking i want that was well said and i see the material as forward looking it, it, it isn't just cynical look you know joke after joke about how look how dumb that idea is or look how dumb that idea was it, it's kind of knocking it's refreshing the playing field a little bit so that we can move forward in some new and exciting ways and i was kind of wondering i, I was planning if you asked me am i a buddhist oh yeah, yeah. i would have uh, i would have said really more uh, you know i think that if you're looking for a label for yourself you should be probably thinking about verbs rather than nouns because nouns are very static and we are not static we are moving but i thought really more i'm more of a primate than i am a taoist a buddhist an existentialist yeah a jew yeah so i i i i i have jokes about evolutionary biology in in, in the material and i touch on it and i i, I um I think that we are at an evolutionary turning point. I mean, um, we have to be, I think. Now we, we are, we, we've reached the brink. One of the jokes yeah. in the book is, um, what is it? The, um, oh, uh, it's near the end of, of it. We've been so, uh, we've been so successful as a species that we're on the brink of extinction. Yeah. Yeah, human, pretty much. Yeah. We've done so human, well for ourselves. Humans have done so well for ourselves that we're at the brink of extinction. And I know that's kind of an, and it, it, it's not necessarily a funny joke, but it has its place in the universe of my material because it's suggesting something that is not, um, that's not an ancient problem, that's a modern problem. So we better, I think, um, I, I think we should agree that in, in our search for meaning, and what does it mean to have meaning in our lives now? I think it's clear that the challenge facing us is how to live together on this world and to be masterful stewards of this planet. And that is the meaningful thing that we can do. 
and then we can buy our way into having another million years to think about things. Yeah, and to figure it out why we're, why we're really here. Yeah. We just have yeah. to figure out how to stay here. Yeah, um, like so, so let's, let's put our disagreements aside. Let's just yeah. stay here. Let's make that the goal and buy time for, our, uh, for us to continue. It's kind of like a friend from the Judaic community was talking about why the Jewish people had to wander in the desert for 40 years before they entered the promised land. And that was, um, and this is just an allegory I'm bringing up for illustration, but that was so that they can purify themselves of the slavery mentality that they had had in Egypt so that when they entered the promised land, they were a different kind of holy people. And that's just a story, but hopefully we can, I, I really, one of the jokes in my book is we owe it to future generations to cut all ties with the past. Yeah. And start so, afresh. Um, uh, uh, start afresh. I think that is really kind of one of the underlying themes. It, I mean, it does sound like this book is a bit of a, a protest almost against current thinking and where we've ended up. And it's almost like saying, I'm, I'm done with this a little bit. Is it, is there, there a kind of rebelliousness in what you're trying to do here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that word. Yeah. I think, I think in a way I'm making fun of all wisdom traditions in this and I'm not necessarily making fun of them. I mean, I'm inviting us to look at it all from surprising angles, but uh, um, I, I don't think we should rest on our laurels and call ourselves Buddhists or Taoists. I think that we are still primates and struggling to understand our role and our place and how to translate that ball of instincts and thoughts and, and emotional dispositions into sane, functional human beings operating in the world and and so it is rebellious really I, I i i draw from traditions but i also want us to move beyond them your your own um tradition if you like you you mentioned before when we spoke before you you are you were brought up jewish mm -hmm. and you you hitchhiked to israel to mm -hmm. um uh, and i don't know we we kind of touched on it, but we didn't go into details. But there's a story here, isn't there? And oh, there is. There is. Yes. Tell me about this story. Well, I was rebellious as a teenager, and I think so. That word is very apt to describe me. I left home when I was pretty young, before I even finished high school. I I mean, I finished high school, but I left early and went on a grand a grand adventure as a 17 year old boy, and went through Europe. I thought Europe was too much like the USA. It, yeah. was, it was cool. It was interesting. It was a little different, but basically a lot of the same norms applied. So I made my way into the Middle East and I hitchhiked through Turkey and I hitchhiked down through Syria and Jordan. And there's so many stories I could tell you about that. And then came over the Allenby Bridge into from Jordan into the West Bank of Israel or Palestine and then into Israel and I was, uh, and I've stayed there for a number of months. One day I was in Jerusalem, sort of hanging out at the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, and a rabbi, a guy from Canada found me and invited me to lunch and said, you want to really learn what this is really all about? And um, I agreed to go have lunch with those guys. And I, he was part of a yeshiva, which is a school, uh, an Orthodox school for boys. And they were trying to attract Canadians and South Africans and sort of West French and English uh, young Jewish men and bring them back into the Orthodox tradition. That's really why this, uh, this school exists. It's all, it was all in English and they taught you a little bit of Hebrew and Aramaic. And I enjoyed staying there. I used to jog around the old city in the morning of Jerusalem and had a place to stay. And they were all really bright pals. And they gave me a place to call home for a few months. And so I did stay there and was challenged and had my thinking challenged pretty um, rigorously by, by the rabbis and by the content of the class that they're, the classes that they're presenting. And um, Judaism is very much about morality, it's about cosmology, it, it, it's about language and philosophy and the relationship between the finite world and the infinite, and it, 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 it's big, it's a lot, and it's a, it's a very erudite 
bookish tradition and they have a lot of material to come at me with and one and man, when I met them I was sort of reading the electric Kool-Aid acid test by Ken Kesey it was just like wow what a what a funny match yes. but um, you know had long curly hair and was um, really um, not the typical yeshiva student perhaps but um, one day there was a, a war or a battle, um, a battle between the Israeli army and the, Palest the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization. And there was rumor that Yasser Arafat had been um, injured and he was the head of the PLO at that time. And this was just news that was just being said, uh, you know, by mouth. This was before smartphones and technology like that. You know, they were kind of celebrating. They just got these big smiles on their face, like, woohoo, man, maybe that guy was killed. And I didn't, I rebelled against that. I did not agree that, I just didn't seem right to me. And I, I'm not going to say I am going to claim some moral high ground or that I can be really righteous like that, but I was righteous like that. I thought we shouldn't, we should maybe be happy in a more solemn way. And, but not celebrate that somebody was killed and war is bad. And it, it was a pretty naive point of view, to be honest with you. I had been in the region all of five months. Why was I an expert? I was just turned 18 at that point. But they, I held my ground and I said, I, we shouldn't celebrate. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. Actually, it's okay to celebrate. And they took out the Talmud, which is kind of the book of yeah. interpretation and thumbed through the pages and got, see right here, it says right here that when, when the Israelites left Egypt and um, got to the across the Red Sea, the Pharaoh's armies came behind them and cl closed the waters down upon them. I think most people know that story. Um, and the Egyptian armies were drowned. And the Israeli people on the other side, in the Sinai on the Sinai Peninsula, sang songs and celebrated. And Miriam, Moses' sister, led him and they said, see, it's okay. It's okay to celebrate when your enemy yep. is being vanquished. And I, I, I said, you know, I don't think so, guys. I mean, I get it that they did, but these are modern times and I just don't agree. And they, we got into an argument about it. And things were kind of going south for me with them anyway, because I had been caught bringing girls back to the dormitory a couple <laughs> of times. And I was kind of dating this non-Jewish girl from Norway at the time. And it, it, it wasn't going well at all. And then this was kind of my big rebellious act. And <clears throat> I, I just couldn't really agree with their point of view on that. And me and my girlfriend, or, you know, my, 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 my pal from Norway, we went out to dinner at a, in a Chinese restaurant in the Arab quarter of the old city. Yeah, it's a good mix, eclectic. Yeah. So I don't know how you got there. You had to go through a lot of, uh, you know, alleyways and dark corners, but we got to this Chinese restaurant and I can't remember the food at all, but what I do remember is I got a fortune cookie at the end of that meal and I read it and it hit like a ton of bricks. It really, really made an impression on me that I remember obviously to this day. And um, it, in a way it set me forth on some of my future. Um, and, and it was a quote from someone named Lao Tzu. I didn't know, you know, how to even pronounce his name. I now know, of course, he's, a, a, you know, a, a fabled writer of Taoism from China. The quote was this: It said, <clears throat> "Conduct your victory like a funeral." And that's apt. I mean, that's the Tao Te Ching, isn't it? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I ever found that. Yeah, it, it's probably from the Tao Te Ching because that's the only writing attributed to Lao Tzu that uh, that exists. But we don't even know if Lao Tzu existed. But yeah, it, it, it's from it's it, it's a it's somebody's interpretation of some set of Chinese characters yes. that landed in a fortune cookie. And so, great fortune cookie. You know, I got like they say in my shows in Chinese restaurants they give you fortune cookies, in Jewish yeah. restaurants they give you misfortune cookies. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, the, I really, I thought that really captured what I was th trying to say better than I could have even said it as a young man like that. And I left the yeshiva after that 
uh, they really pressured me to stay. My mom told me after that she knew I would she would never have to worry about me being caught up in a cult. <laughs> Which is nice. She goes, yeah, nobody's going to pull the wool over your eyes. Yeah, that's reassuring, isn't it? Yeah, yes. And so, but that was a great experience. I left. And then eventually, I'll just end this little story by saying that I came back to the United States and I sort of drifted out to California where I got a degree in Pacific Rim Studies, studied Mandarin, studied uh, history of sort of Buddhist and Taoist thought in China and some in China, Japan and Korea, but mostly in China and wrote of, discovered a Taoist poet from the second century AD, way later than Lao Tzu and Zhuang Tzu that captivated my imagination. And I wrote a senior thesis and a big paper about the life and work of this poet who was a very conflicted individual and very emotional individual. And, um, and so that, I think that fortune cookie sort of tipped my way to expand my horizons if that makes sense yeah i, I spoke to martha beck um a while ago and she um she talks about her spirit mule um which is kind of this this kind of made up creature who who sends her messages and she says the best way to understand what your spirit mule is is it's is basically your your intuition talking to you so um, you, you mentioned right at the beginning talking about, um, you know, getting messages from the, the things in the room around you and, and what, noticing what you're noticing and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And this, um, this fortune cookie came at just the right time for you. You know, I mean, they could have had just bucket loads of this, this fortune cookie with the same fortune in for everybody, but it just happened yeah. to be that you were receptive to that at, at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it came out of this kind of conflict of, of ideas that you were having um with your your colleagues about how to how to mark the potential death of of this this person this kind of enemy of the state if you like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's it's again it goes back to this dissonance this whole idea of these two ideas pulling away from each other and leaving you kind of open to to new ideas and it, for me that that kind of that fortune cookie is almost like a metaphor for what you were saying before and you know with you're doing this with your jokes you're you're having this conflict of ideas and that leaves you open to, to something new. It opens up almost like it opens the pores in your skin to absorb something new, whether that's a message from a fortune cookie or whether that's kind of a new, a new idea or a piece of imagination or, or something, just your intuition telling you something. I mean, maybe that's what you're trying to do with these jokes. Maybe that's what your, the aim of the game is. Yeah. Open people I, up a little bit. <clears throat> yes. I, I've been thinking about that too. And, in, in a way, it's almost like Hegelian, di the Hegelian dialectic and that there's a thesis, which is the setup of the joke. And then in my case, in the way I write, there's the antithesis is yeah. the punchline. And they don't, they're, they're two different things moving in two different directions, like you pointed out, like the title of the book, Letting Go is All We Have to Hold On To. It, it's it's self-referential. And so in a way I'm doing with jokes what um, Max Escher was doing with figurative drawing, um, showing that there's, you can put reasonable components together into one statement and they, they contradict each other, but yet they also do somehow go together and allude to some meaning somehow. Um, and so in an optimistic way of thinking about what you're describing, it, in, he in Hegel's world, the synthesis is a higher plane of meaning that is suggested out of these two opposing um, components. And um, I think, though, it's also possible that um, I'm showing you the futility of thoughts, too, that it yeah. is, there isn't actually a synthesis. There's this sort of dissonance, and you're just sort of left there it's funny, but you're not really given an answer. You don't really, you're not given closure. And so maybe after these jokes, there's a way of thinking about, there's a way that your mind is engaged that is just, you don't know what to think maybe. And now I'm just really thinking out loud with you. Like maybe it creates this, this dissonance creates this moment of, wow, that was really funny. And it, it both does and does not make sense. And it makes me smile and it makes my brain fire in a slightly different way that 
perhaps is making me you know, alert to new ways of thinking or new, there's an openness it creates. It's interesting, there's, a, there's another painting by Escher, which is it's called Three Worlds. And it's a, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a sketch of a lake. And you see the, you know, the surface of the water and in the surface of the water there is reflected the trees from the, the bank of the lake. But be below the water, you can also see the, the fish. So you have these three different worlds. You have the water, you have the, the reflection of the trees and the trees themselves, and then the fish underneath. Oh. And that reminds me a little bit of what, something you were saying before. And it, um, Carl Jung said, uh, beneath the threshold of consciousness, everything was seething with, with life. And it's this, this whole notion that, that language, if you like, sort of cog consciousness it's a very superficial veneer on what is, what is really going on. And, and the, the kind of ancient Chinese philosophers said, you know, I think it was the Chinese philosophers, they, they said, that, you know, once, w once we intellectualize something, we've changed it forever, that our thought of it is not actually what the truth of it. You know, you can't actually intellectualize a tree, for example, or life or anything like that. You can create a kind of two-dimensional um, version of it out of, made out of words, but it's, it's, only, it's only a very thin... Um, artificial representation even mm -hmm. no matter how much we try to comprehend and maybe this is all about pushing through you know pushing through the words pushing through any ideas of of thought maybe that's what the whole point of koans are to begin with you know it's pushing through just saying you know all your efforts are trying to understand this this whole reason why you're here this it's futile don't try to understand it just get comfortable with not understanding it maybe that's the whole point I mean, I really like how you said that. I, I, I concur. And I think both the Buddhist and Taoist traditions have, um, uh, you know, this element uh, as part of their core, the kind of futility of thought, that there's sort of a, uh, like, well, the, the, the Tao Te Ching begins with the famous phrase, uh, Dao Ke Dao Fei Chang Dao, which is the, the Dao that can be, and I have a joke about it in my book, yeah. you know, here's the joke. Lao Tzu knew the way that can be spoken of is not the eternal way, which explains why he was so quiet at parties. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't into small talk, but yeah, as soon as you try to make one statement, you've, you've sort of punctured the unified whole. Yeah, it's like that, that whole... Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that, that's another thing in, in Judaism as well, isn't it? It's the, the true name of God can't be spoken. And, uh, yeah. and I think it was, I think it was Lao Tzu said, you know, he who knows or that which knows doesn't speak and that which speaks doesn't know, you know, there's this whole kind of unknowableness of the infinite, you know? Yes. Right. And, in Hebrew, it's called Ein Sof, which means without end. And of the different, dimensions um, or faces of God that Jewish mystics have described. There's the one that is just outside the bounds of human knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and so it's not, and which makes me suddenly think of my, one of my favorite quotes from the physicist Heisenberg, um, which is not only is the universe stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. And it's, um, you know, also gets to the heart of something similar, strangely. Yeah. It's funny because you're, um, and this is in, in no way meant as a, a kind of insult or anything like that, but one of your most, um, your biggest audiences is kind of care homes for elderly people. So you've, you've had a lot of book sales through care homes. Is, is this right? This is in some of the, the source material I was sent. Yes, and there was <clears throat> people find a lot of comfort in in your jokes because I suppose when you're when you're in that situation and you're kind of there and you're thinking what was it all for, there is some comfort in kind of understanding that maybe there is no point mm -hmm. after all, so it's it's okay. Yes, I think comfort is the key word that's jumping out for me, and that <laughs> probably there isn't uh, when pro people of all ages don't necessarily have great formats or um, <clears throat> curriculum to guide their thinking about the meaning of life. We're, we're at a stoplight, now we're turning left, we're thinking about the next errand we have to do, we're busy, we've got busy lives. And this book, this collection of jokes is probably for, for seniors 
Um, but I really think people of all ages, um, a nice way to think about things from that higher plane, a little bit like, what did all this mean? And how does the mind work? And who am I? What is identity? What is time? And, but to do so in a way that isn't like trying to read Immanuel Kant, you know, yeah. or read Descartes' Principia Mathematica, it, it, it brings it home. It kind of democratizes philosophy in my, you know, in, in my humble opinion. It's, let's just joke around about these issues um, so that they're not quite so intimidating and they're accessible to all of us. Do you think that, I mean, you had your own conflicts with religion growing up, I suppose, is one way of saying it. Um, do you think this is, for you, this has been an effort to kind of find your own resolution to that? Just to say, kind of like, as, as a person, as an author, I will never fully understand. And this, this is me not understanding, and I'm okay with that. I love it. God, I love that. That is really well said. This, right, it's almost like saying, I almost can come up with a joke right now, you know, oh, you know, I don't know the truth and that's my story and I'm sticking with it, yeah. like, you know. Well, one of the jokes in the book is, you know, you have to learn how to argue both sides of an argument. There's no two ways about it. <laughs> um, it it's kind of like, look how dumb, you know, it's a little like, it's playing the clown, a little yeah. bit like look how dumb I, I say i'm saying things that i don't realize are contradictory but the reader can see it yeah so i am the butt of my own humor but um I don't know, maybe i'm trying to say it's okay not to know in fact it's better not to know and i'm so glad we got to this part of the conversation because I, I i forget about this but yeah this is a let, let's all not know for a while i think we'll be better off yeah and I, I think that's that's the problem. I mean, you mentioned dogma earlier on. It's like we've we've replaced attempting to know with just dogma. So it's like I'm I'm over here. This is my philosophy, and this is my camp. Mm -hmm. And you're over there, and that's your philosophy, and that's your camp. And we're just you know, there's no meeting in the middle because I'm a Democrat and I'm a Republican or whatever it whatever it happens to be. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the opposite of intellectual thought really isn't it i mean the, the true wise man is is somewhere floating in between and he's a democrat on one day depending on what his day is going like he's a republican on another day and he can see the kind of um the benefits and the the pros and cons of both sides whereas dogma does away with having to understand altogether and you just kind of follow the rules and we're seeing the danger of that, really. You know, yeah. we have now entered a period of history where the desire to feel like you know the right answer is trumping rigorous inquiry and open-ended discussion, you know? And so, wow, people really want to think like they know. And yeah. it's frightening because it creates zealots. Obviously, we're seeing zealotry become the mood of the day and it's terrifying i'm i'm and you know i'm religiously anti-zealot yeah, yeah. right there I'm, yeah when it comes to anti-zealotry i take a religious stance yeah um so i would like us to all really accept that we don't know there's so much we don't know it's going to be fun to learn together yeah let's learn together who we are let's we don't know but in this era of um, alternative facts in this very very particular chapter of the truth being assaulted the way it's being assaulted by leadership around the world I'm almost reluctant to bring my board game out because actually there are some things that we have to agree on it's very important that we agree on um, and almost be dogmatic about and um, like things like the separation of powers in governments and how governance should be done and uh, so i am glad that we are about at least here in the u.s we're about to enter the next chapter i'm sure it's going to be an interesting one but i feel really excited to bring out my game of tricks in 2021 i've been on the down low in 2020 yeah. <laughs> we're all waiting to see what the heck is going to happen with our world but i think now we know sanity is coming back like i was saying to a friend um, the goal now is let's get back to normal as soon as we can, and then let's revolutionize it. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I mean, there's this whole notion of um, what's the new normal going to look like? What's it going to look like? Everyone's talking about the new normal, waiting for it to turn up. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, well, we actually, it's up to us what the new normal looks like. We can, we get to choose right now. And, you know, there there are whole swathes of the population who've been out of work, you know, furloughed and stuck at home with time on their hands and no kind of framework that, you know, the, the normal Monday to Friday, nine to five to keep them busy is not, has not been there anymore. Mm-hmm. And so there's an opportunity there and people are kind of exploring new ways of kind of living their lives and new ways of thinking, reading books that they've never read before, writing books, this kind of thing. Reinventing it's a opportunity. Themselves. Yes. I, I hope people have been reinventing themselves. I think they've, we've had to a little bit. We've all been forced to reinvent ourselves a little in the COVID-19 period, particularly. Um, and hopefully we're collectively going to reinvent ourselves in some ways and take it further. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know what the new normal will be, uh, but I hope that there's a lot of play. Well, this is what's so great about your the title of your book as well, because it's letting go is all we have to hold on to. And of course, the Buddhists will say attachment is suffering. You know, and, and we've been clinging to this this way of life for so for so long because it's all we've we've known. Yet COVID nineteen comes along and we've been forced to kind of let go of everything we've we've known. Mm-hmm. Because if we if we cling on too hard, it, well, I mean it just turns to dust in our hands. You know, we, we don't have the jobs aren't there anymore. You know, we're all we're all stuck at home socially distancing. We have to let go now. And that's that literally is all we've got to to hold on to. You know, and the more yeah. we cling to, cling, try and cling to it, the, the harder it's going to get. So we do have to let go. And I think it's quite an apt title for, for our times, really. Oh, thank you. You know, um, while you're saying that, I'm realizing, let's see if I can verbalize this, things going wrong can work to our advantage. Yeah. Because maybe we would be stuck in certain ways that seem to be working and seem to be working. But when we're forced to adapt to a challenge, we, a lot of times, new, new resources rise to the top. Yeah. And, and new ways of thinking emerge that make us better than we were before. So even though, well, maybe now I can see why suffering makes people better people. But I have a joke in the book. I never learned all that much from suffering that I didn't pretty much already know. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but I think adapting is important. And so COVID has forced us to adapt. It's forced us to let go of some of the identities that we may have been, you know, become calcified a little bit or calcified ideas that are time that need to be revisited and refreshed. Sometimes a lot of this kind of people who have these kind of, I don't want to say revolutionary thoughts, but kind of slightly deeper approach to life that maybe you're, you're sharing with this, this book of, of um, Zen koans, comical Zen koans, if you like. Yeah. They've been through some things themselves. So, I, I mean, I look at some of the, the very um, uh, inspirational teachers that I follow, people like Sharon Salzberg and Jack Kornfield, you know, the, the Buddhist teachers and mm-hmm. um, a lot of the other, you know, even some of the big self-help gurus have been through personal crises who are in, in no way spiritually aligned with any kind of tradition or religion or anything like that. But, you know, they, they are now, um, these people are sort of trying to getting you to 10 X your life and all, all this kind of stuff, you know, and, um, but they've, they've been through a crisis that has made them reevaluate their world themselves. Is this kind of this mission you're on a little bit like that? Have you been through something that's made you kind of think, hang on, I'm drawing a line here and I need to, need to change things i need to change my thinking i want something different out of life that is a great question and i think that um i'm trying to see why did i start why did i write songs in my 20s and 30s and why did i write poetry in my 30s and 40s and why did i then write comedy humor in my 40s and early 50s and it's a i'm gonna have to think about that one i I have definitely um i'm not sure i can explain why the format of in all cases i'm i'm drawing from 
my the depths of my imagination, yeah. not to overstate it, but I'm trying to draw from the depths and produce product, something that rep something that and, and it's a cellular process. It isn't it, it is something that I must do, that I'm made to do. And um and I'm fortunate. I have a good fortune in life to have been able to cultivate whatever talent I had in those areas and it's hard work and I work hard as a writer and I took out all the mediocre material from this book that I could yeah. anything that I thought was mediocre I tried to take out of the book um, but maybe humor is is the great um, it's redemptive maybe it's more redemptive than the other one it, it, it it's it's very disarming. Uh, there's, it's not pretentious. No one will read this book and think, "Wow, this guy is pretentious," because it is all. Oh, I just opened to the joke I was thinking of before. Empathy has allowed us to succeed so prodigiously as a species. We're on the brink of extinction. Yeah. But um, you know, um, the the humor in here is very disarming. Yeah, some of it's quite tragic, I think. You know, like that that one you said before. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, everything is kind of hopeless in a way, and that, that and that is kind of funny in its in itself. You know, I won't deny that there is there are references to the end of civilization <laughs> in it. My you know my purpose in this moment is to simply wipe the counter, squeeze the sponge over the sink and not think about the end of civilization. <laughs> yes, there's, uh, so, you know, we're trying to position ourselves in the cosmos. Like what are, yeah. what can we agree on here? What's going on here? And so this, this, in a way, this is like a big inventory of, you know, possible uh, building blocks of an identity of understanding things. And so we, we have to position ourselves in the times that we live in and we know that um, the tra Oscar Wilde said there's two kinds of tragedies in life. One is not getting what you want. The other is getting it. Yeah. Yeah. And very clever like so, that. Uh, and I talk about tragedy. Uh, I even say in one of my shows, you know, on my comedy shows, I do comedy. Here I am doing, I call it stand-up philosophy, by the way, but I, I do comedy, but I don't. Sometimes to make a little extra money on the side, I do tragedy on the side. You know, and um, reckoning with suffering and reckoning with tra the tragic elements of our lives has got to be part of a comprehensive body of material. So yeah. I don't think that it falls on tragedy. I think it falls on play. I think ultimately it is sunny material. Yeah, it's bringing us up closer to the light and taking us out of the doldrums of tragedy, but not by dismissing it or avoiding it or pretending that life isn't tragic in some ways. Do you do you think you're trying to find your own piece with this? I mean, I mean, some of the the kind of great comedians over the years, the ones who made people laugh the most, were actually the most kind of troubled, if you like. You know, you look back over history. Do you mm -hmm. think that you're trying to kind of come to terms with your own questions, if you like, or inability to answer those questions by, by saying, hang on, we don't have to answer everything. Maybe, maybe it's okay not to, yeah. like we said before. I, I think you just said that wonderfully. You know, I, I'm not sure I could have said it better. I think that there's a redemptive quality for me. Yeah. I wrestled, um, uh, one of the jokes in the book is, I'm sprawled on the ground wrestling with whether or not I'm my own worst enemy. Um, <laughs> Um, I think that um, comedians suffer because we have um, sharp perceptive skills. And so we yeah. can really kind of see what's going on with words and things and people. And it's painful to see all of that. And um, poets and playwrights, you know, and, you know, usually writers and artists in general are highly sensitive people. And comedians have a special kind of sensitivity to the real subtle nuances of what what's being said without actually being directly stated. Yeah. And so I, um, it, it, you know, I've had a very good life 
Um, and, and, and my good life has created a wonderful playing field in which for me to wrestle with ideas and conflict and be in turmoil in a way where I can produce honest work. And that's the most important thing of all. So somehow my road to honesty went from po kind of from songs to poems to humor. And I'm very satisfied with it. I'm very satisfied with, I think I've made a clear statement, not knowing is okay. In fact, it, we should do a little more of that. Yeah. Yeah, I think, that's a, I think that's a great place to be. You know, I remember I, I was in court once. Um, there was a, a, a guy drove his car into me and then drove off. And it was, um, it was completely his, his fault, but we, I ended up in court. And the, um, I remember I was very young at the time and I remember the, the lawyers on the day came in and I'd never met them before. I just, I just turned up on the day. This, this guy was in the dock and I had to give evidence. And they said, what's going to happen is the, the um, defense counsel is going to try and ask you questions and catch you out. And if you don't know the answer, just say, I don't know. Just say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's okay to say, I don't know, because, you know, we're not infinite beings, you know, we're not the all seeing omnipotent eye of whatever is out there. We're just here, you know, like you said, we're primates and it's okay to <laughs> say, I don't know sometimes, you know, you yeah. know, we keep falling over, we keep bumping our heads into things and keep, you know, getting up and dusting ourselves off, but it's okay to, to admit that, you know, we're not perfect. We're not meant to be perfect. Right. You know, in preparing for this talk today, about an hour ago, I wrote, something I've never written before, which is uh, segueing right off what you just said. And that is, I think a lot of what we think we know hurts us. Yeah. I don't think we know it hurts us, but it, it, a lot of things that we think we know about people's motivations, about our own motivations, about the way fate works, about the way the world works is actually we're hurting ourselves. But I think that comes back to that whole notion of attachment. You know, we're, we're grasping on to this kind of, this thing that we identify with, this, this kind of knowing, even when we don't know. We're trying to hold on to something that isn't there. And that, that's where our, our suffering comes from. And by the title of your book again, when we can let go, that's when actually, you know, things start to go all right. They start to go in our favor because it's okay not to try so hard, you know, it's okay not to attach ourselves to this thing that doesn't really exist. You know, there's two, I, I concur. And there's two quotes in my, in the introduction to my book that I think say what you've just said so eloquently. <laughs> One of them is by Greg Lavoie and he talks about holding paradox. And he says, the heroic skill of holding paradox, the endless struggle between two things that are each 100% true and at complete odds with each other, it's not some parlor game or some pose you strike. It is ferocious and dizzying work that you do at the edge of a cliff. It, is, it takes courage to not know. It takes yeah. courage to sit with the question. One of the jokes in my book is, Rulke advises us to learn to love the questions, but that's because the answers are usually pretty distressing. <laughs> um, the other quote here is, um, and then I want to end with one more from Jerry Garcia, but Max Planck, uh, uh, the brilliant uh, quantum physicist said, science cannot solve the ultimate mystery of nature because in the last analysis, we ourselves are part of the mystery that we are trying to solve. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that's quite a religious thing, isn't it? I mean, a lot of this, a lot of physics comes back to religion. You know, I mean, you hear physicists quoting religious scripture a lot, you know. Um, Oppenheimer quoted the uh, uh, Mahabharata, didn't he? And, um, you know, there's a lot of this. Uh, Einstein talks about kind of very spiritual things in some of his writings and some of his kind of work as well. You know, it's almost yeah. like what it's almost, I, I've kind of said before that scientists are like magicians who are trying to figure out how the, the magic works, you know, because th th there's so much magic around us. And, and until we know the, the mechanics of it all, it, it will remain magic. And the mm -hmm. scientists and the physicists and the philosophers, they're at the, the very edge of 
what is magic and what is real you know it's that kind and of humorists and humorists and humorists yeah well so, Bertrand Russell said and I quote him in my book um a mathematician who isn't also something of a poet will never be a complete mathematician well right. there has to be there has to be an art to it doesn't there there has to be all of this is a creative thing Math, mathematics science comedy it's all it's all creative it's all that kind of mind body spirit thing you, you said you were talking at the beginning about kind of that gut instinct and, and listening to your body that kind of physical mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. of of thinking and being mm -hmm. it's all a kind of connected thing you know and like jerry garcia once said who's the guitar player for the grateful dead when he was asked by a radio interviewer, what gets in the way of your creativity the most? He paused for just about a second and said, everything I think. Yeah. And, uh, and what a brilliant response to me in a way that is, that, that is one of the wiser quips that I quote in my book. And, and I think that is the point of my book is that almost everything we think can get in the way of us knowing more about the subject at hand and what you think about something that's great but don't let it get in the way of your inquiry and so i i like to say when i want to know what i think about something i try to write a joke about it yeah it forces me to walk around it and do the whole circumference and look at it from above and below and um and understand the different arguments that could be made just about one phrase or one word even yeah, that's a, that's a, I mean, that's a brilliant thing. I, I mean, I keep coming back to the same things about this whole pulling apart, you know, you pull apart and you realize there's kind of nothing in the middle and that's what these koans are all about. You know, they're to examine really what's going on with us. The, the, mm -hmm. the question is not to find an answer. The question is to find ourselves in that, that question. And maybe that's what these, these jokes are about. There's a meditation in there about, our own sense of understanding and and comprehension and looking beyond language and reason and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. right you were asking me before is in my jokes there's two sort of two th things moving in opposite directions at the same time and there's a dissonance between them and is that kind of the leonard cohen crack that lets the light in or is oh, yeah. that the hegelian is that the moment where the thesis and antithesis can be fused together in some type of synthesis? Or is it sort of where you're, you're left by the side of the road and there is no closure and there's a kind of futility? Futility has a negative connotation. Um, and maybe it doesn't have to be so negative. Maybe really just calling it a place of not knowing in suspension where you're suspending belief it's not a parlor game it's ferocious and it's dizzying to niels bohr also a quantum physicist said how marvelous that we have arrived at paradox now we have a chance of making some progress yeah and so here we are kind of the edge what i like to say i like to say uh, my material is playing at the edge of knowledge how far can we take something to its absurd, illogical conclusion until we throw up our hands and say, what is the way forward? So that brings me on, actually. You mean, you've, you've talked about being on this kind of road trip, if you like, this journey that saw you hitchhiking through Turkey and the Middle East and spending time in Israel and then carrying on to California and playing music and you work in um, energy now mm -hmm. and you, you Play, make music you make jokes you do write books are you on a journey somewhere where, where where do you go next where do you go from from here what's the next next part of your your journey of discovery where does it take you yeah that's wonderful i um for some reason i'm just reminded of a quote that norman mailer said and it um which is whenever i sit down to write whatever I write has to be even more raw and more honest than what I wrote last time. And so I, I trust the process. I am not knowing my way into the future a little bit, but I believe that we are at some really interesting turning points. And I do think that I am reinventing myself in this very chapter, in these very times that we live in, 
Um, I don't want to try to over explain it because I'm waiting for some of it to emerge. Yeah. And I don't want to be sound too esoteric or evasive either. Um, I, as a, I, as a writer, I have, have a long history of asking honest questions and then waiting patiently and then getting hitting striking minds and striking veins and getting in there. And so lately I've been writing essays. I want to come out of the COVID Trump era, a different person. Yeah. And I can't quite tell you how that all will be or where I will live or what my life will be next. But I will say that just very personally, very personally, my, my, I feel a sense of completion in many ways. So I'm looking forward to new beginnings where I live in Boulder, Colorado. And I, I like to say, I don't have to just get older in Boulder. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. want to just get older. I, I fear that that could happen. Uh, um, stagnancy is a very lonely thing. I believe. Yeah. I think, um, I can't remember who said it, but they said that everything that is alive is constantly changing. And when mm -hmm. things stand still, that's when they start to die. And it's, uh, you know, so if you look at the things that don't move like rocks and, you know, inanimate objects, they're pretty dead, but trees and animals and they're constantly moving and changing and that kind of thing. So I, d I don't think we're meant to stay still. You're not going to get older and bolder. I don't think you're going to yeah, I don't keep think going. So. Yeah. Well, that's why I said, if you want to label yourself, come up with a verb, not a noun, yeah. you know? And so I'm not a Buddhist. No, Buddhism is an ancient religion. You know, uh, I'm a modern, I'm a modern scientist. Uh, you know, I'm of the, I live in the age of science. Um, and happily so. But so I hope that I will be able to take my own advice like chapter one of my book, take my advice and think for yourself. But yep. two, there's a way of letting, there's a, if you stay suspended in not knowing a little bit, not about everything, but in a general way, if you, you don't know, but you want to know, you don't know, but you want to know, that's a good place to be. You still don't know it, but you still want to, but now you're getting, you're starting to put the pieces together. It's an intuitive process. And I think it's very hard. Being a person is very hard, like finding your identity and finding your, for everybody, not just me. And I may, it may be more confusing for people with more options. Yep. Uh, but I don't want to rush into my next comfortable little set of words that I use to describe about where I'm going next as if I know. I yeah. hope that I live more immersed in nature. I hope that I can cultivate a kind of joy in being alive in that um, because I've produced the work that I have needed to produce as a writer. I don't need to write another book. I don't need to do more podcasts. In a way, I'd like, uh, I'd like to get to the point where I'm at the destination. Yeah. I'm at the destination. I live at the destination. Anything else is extra. I don't know if that's idealistic. Uh, one of the jokes that I've written since I published my book, so it's not in the book, but it's an important joke for me, is if you don't realize you're already at the destination, quote unquote, you have a long way to go. <laughs> well, that's it, isn't it? I mean, this is what it's, what it's all about. It's about letting go of that grasping. You're already there. You know, let go of wanting more because the moment you find gratitude for what you've already got is the moment you realize you're you're wealthy beyond your wildest dreams but i can't remember who it was it was one of the famous writers they were they were at a a um at the house of a wealthy businessman and uh, this is back in probably california actually um and these two writers that might have been ernest, ernest hemingway and someone else that one turned to the other and said you know, this guy makes in a day more than you've made in your entire writing career. And the other writer says, yeah, but I've, I've got enough, you know, and it's, mm -hmm. it's that it's, mm -hmm. it's, you're always at your destination. If you understand that you've got enough right now. And that's, that's all about letting go of wanting more, you know, that, that constant letting go. And that's, that's all we've got to hold on to, you know? Yeah. I'm enjoying this conversation so much because <laughs> you're right on it with me. You're right on it with me. Um, one of the jokes in my book is uh, the best way to stop looking for yourself is probably just around the next corner. Yeah. 
Because I'm playing with that. How do we do that? How do we bridge this contradiction between feeling whole of, of, in, in the moment of where we are, yet also knowing there's more to do and there's more ahead of us and that there will be striving and there should be striving? Um, how do we balance the, 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 the drive to excel with yeah. the need to... Um, just dwell on the present uh, to appreciate what is without feeling disturbed. I think Jack Cornfield, I don't know if you know Jack Cornfield, but he's a, he's a Buddhist teacher, a modern Buddhist teacher, but he says, um, you know, we need to accept that we're perfect, but with room for improvement, you know, that's, um, <laughs> I, love that. oh. I think it's a nice way of kind of, of kind of saying, okay, I'm happy with who I am, but I'm going to still keep moving. I'm going to keep moving forward and being, trying to be better anyway. Right, right. Yeah. Um, that reminds me of one of the jokes in my book. What is, oh, I'm still waiting for the ideal moment to come along to accept life's imperfections. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. And, and there's a lot of truth in all of this, really. I think it's a great book. I'm going to, I just got half an eye on, on the time at the moment. I don't want to, um, I don't want to keep you too long, but there, there's, what, how many jokes? There's 750, is it? Per se? I mean, I haven't counted. There's 16 chapters. Yeah. yeah, I can't. I don't know. There's there there's maybe 25 in each chapter. But if you, if you read oh, maybe 35, I can't remember. If you read one a day, it would keep you busy for two years. Yeah, at least. At least. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a good investment of time and money, really, just to give you something to think about beyond your day-to-day -day existence. I, you know, in the preface. Uh, um, my colleague wrote a preface for me and her, one of the things that she wrote is that you, when you read the Eisenberg principles, you feel understood at least for yeah. a moment. Like you're not alone in the chasm of, of existential doubt. You know, we're, we're all there. We're all working with language that isn't a perfect vehicle or tool for describing. Uh, and I think one of the most important a philosophical jokes in the book is um, I still haven't wrapped my mind around the fact that thoughts can't describe reality. Yeah. Yeah. I can That's one of the ones I picked up on as I was reading before, before our conversation. And it, it's funny, it's going back to Martha Beck as well. We talked very much about the acquisition of language, you know, we're, in a way she kind of thinks that we're born with a kind of knowledge that we lose the moment we start to, accumulate language you know this this non-verbal um sense of being that starts to evaporate once we we start to refine who we are in terms of culture and language and you know traditions and norms and all that kind of stuff that somewhere inside us there is a a kind of pure form if you like of of primate who is who is more connected with our place in the universe than than any kind of big thinking person could ever be. Really. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we learned that primates felt more comfortable in the universe than they did in the little social groups that they are part of. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. You know, sure. there's no pressure, is there, in the universe? But as, as soon as you start to kind of socialize things, suddenly there's, there's pressure and there's obligation and you have to pick the nits out of someone else's hair and all of this kind yeah. of stuff. There's a lot to be done. There's a yeah, lot exactly. To, to stay accepted by the group, and so we're an anxious creature. There's just there's there's no doubt about it. We're anxious, and there is tragedy in life. And the spirit of philosophy and humor, I think, should somehow help us just lighten our load a little bit. And yeah. Just feel a little bit more comfortable in the terrain in which we find ourselves. It's kind of like saying, yeah, there's, there's huge unanswered questions here. But that's okay. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. In fact, let's have fun chipping away at them and let's not yeah. be in any rush to answer them. Um, and we'll enjoy each other and ourselves more. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's a good idea. Be careful of what you know. And uh, maybe I can even end with this quote also in the introduction of my book by Stephen Hawking, who said, The greatest enemy of knowledge is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. Yeah. And That's on January twentieth, twenty twenty-one, we can go to town with that. <laughs> Absolutely. We will. We will. 
Well, that's a brilliant one to end on. I'll, I'll um, just, if anyone who wants to find out more about you and your work and your comedy and, you know, I suppose you've not been doing many performances with COVID-19, but where, where can they go to find out more about um, the work you're doing? Sure. Yeah. I, my publishing house is called Curved Space Comedy. Okay. Um, aptly so, I think we're, if you think of our conversation, um, and you can go to www curved space comedy.com and you can find letting go is all we have to hold on to on amazon Fantastic. and therein there's links to my shows and to my websites and um and uh, by the way it is now in the top 20 in the comedy section oh fantastic which uh thank you so much i take as a big accomplishment and it's um also starting to rank in the top 20 in the judeo section next okay. to Victor Frankel man's search for meaning I'm very honored that my book appears next to next to yeah. that title rubbing shoulders with, with the greats there yeah, great. yeah. I'm, I'm right there with Trevor Noah and um, Tina Fey and Steve Martin so it's Fantastic. easy to find on Amazon it's a great gift for people I, like we say on the title on the cover it's an ideal gift for people who don't read books yeah Fantastic. Well, brilliant. Well, I, I will leave it there and I'll leave you to get on. Yeah. Um, but thank you for your time and your, your thoughts and your ideas. I feel like we could have gone on for many more hours, but yeah. um, uh, I, I will leave. I won't let our listeners suffer any more of us kind of getting carried away, but um, <laughs> I appreciate your, your time anyway. So thank, thank you, you so much for that. I have enjoyed the conversation so much, Chris. Yeah, thank me too. You. Thanks a lot. All right, so I hope you enjoyed that conversation with me and Greg Eisenberg. His book, uh, Letting Go is All We Have to Hold On To, is available on Amazon. Seek it out. It's, uh, it's good reading. If you were to read one joke a day and ponder on that, it would take you more than two years to get through everything. And hopefully by the end of it, you will come out with some new perspectives and some new ways of thinking and new ways of kind of just being in the world because there's a lot to take in. If you want to find out more about Greg, he's at um, www.curvedspacecomedy and uh, you can find out all about his writing, his music, his comedy, his book uh, there. And uh, hopefully there was something in that conversation for you to ponder on, or at least to, to kind of let go of, because that's what this is all about. It's all about stop stopping struggling with uh, being here, being in this kind of world that we've created, and just get comfortable with not knowing all the answers. All right, so there's more to come um, in following podcasts. I've got some very interesting people lined up from a whole diverse uh, kind of background, and it's all about finding our place in the world, being and being better. All right, I hope you enjoyed that. And, uh, you know, find out more about my podcast, chrisbrock.uk slash podcasts. Wherever you get this or wherever you get your podcast, don't forget to subscribe, review, rate, give us five stars, all that kind of stuff. Apparently that's really important. I don't know why, but I'm sure it is relevant to algorithms somewhere. And uh, yeah, just uh, keep on listening. I really appreciate all the ears uh, who have taken the time to give me their attention. And I hope there's something here for everybody. All right. Thanks a lot and have a lovely day.